I'm uh, um, Leoz Edgar from the Hebrew University. Um, uh, one of the organizer of this uh, um, workshop conference. Um, unfortunately, as you heard, all the terrible situation in Israel, we were not able to, to arrive. This is really a, a recording in progress. Something that we planned. Um, just from a personal point of view, um, I have uh, friends who are now fighting on the borders and some people which I know who were murdered. Uh, so um, I will try to do this session as as best as I can. But uh, forgive me if there will be some uh, something which will be not so accurate. Um, first, also uh, Professor Elad Gross from the Hebrew University will not join us to this session. So we have just three speakers here. Um, so you will have more time uh, yeah, later on, on the conference. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the session is um, actually continue uh, the first one. Uh, this one discussed the decarbonization and the defoliation, which actually uh, kind of uh, similar uh, things. Um, first, how to reduce carbon from what we are using, if it's fuels or any other energy resources, and also to develop some new way of renewable energy, which are not using at all carbon. Uh, this is the main idea here. Uh, as I said, we have three speakers. Um, the first one will be uh, Carla Zeigel from uh, BASF, um, already here and ready. Um, so Carla, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and uh, first of all, I would also like to um, really um, convey my sincere condolences um, for all the lives lost and the injured in the terror attacks over the last days. And I think I speak also on behalf of my company, BSF, and uh, our thoughts are with the families and with the friends. Um, and I'm really deeply impressed by the commitment of uh, all the participants uh, from the Israeli delegation in this symposium. Um, it's really something that um, I think is, um, yeah, um, heartwarming to see that, that we stand together also in these um, um, changing and challenging times. Yeah, um, dear scientific committee, dear distinguished members of the academies, um, I would like uh, to start the session um, on a view of the chemical industry transformation that is ahead of us because I strongly believe um, that it's uh, closely connected um, to the energy transformation and uh, I would like to take uh, the time to um, elaborate on how to take the next step in climate protection from this perspective. And I think we in the international community all know that um, there are um, big challenges ahead of us um, when it comes to climate protection, limited use of resources and the supply of, of energy in the future. And at the same time, I think we live in times of groundbreaking innovation, which um, has also been um, already showed in the, in the first sessions uh, that um, we attended. And uh, we as BSF live up to our uh, corporate purpose, we create chemistry for a sustainable future. And uh, in this purpose, it's clearly reflected what we do and why we do it. So we want to create, or by, by doing this, by creating chemistry for a sustainable future, we do this for our customers, but also for society. And uh, we focus on the best uh, use of uh, the available resources in an environmental uh, context. So just a quick recap um, where um, the company is active in and uh, with uh, more than 100,000 employees worldwide, um, we supply um, a number of industries um, with our uh, products, uh, our product range, uh, comprises uh, chemicals up to agricultural solution products, um, also uh, materials um, for various applications, um, dispersions, resins, performance chemicals, catalysts and coatings, up to um, care chemicals and uh, uh, materials for, so vitamins and the like for nutrition and health. And uh, as uh, a strong player uh, with headquarters in um, Europe, the European Green Deal is also um, for us really um, 
a key um, um, aspect to consider and uh, it is not only about climate neutral uh, neutrality in Europe in 2050 um, but it is a broad um, a plan that the EU maps out currently at an unprecedented speed um, to become um, to beside becoming climate no neutral, decouple economic growth from resource use and to strive for an environment free uh, of pollutants. And um, I think uh, taking this into consideration, you can imagine that uh, the chemical industry is, is really uh, affected uh, in, in these many areas um, by the um, plans of the EU um, at the moment. Yeah, looking at our commitments uh, to sustainability, um, now what does it mean concrete? Also BSF has committed to uh, reach net zero emission to, to emissions by 2050 and to reduce emissions by 25% by 2030. And uh, in addition, it's not only about um, the CO2 emissions, it's also about how to embark into um, the circularity um, for the future. And there our goal is to double our sales, uh, our circular sales by 2030 um, to 17 billion euro. When we look at uh, what is ahead of us, um, when we want to achieve our CO2, our um, greenhouse gas emission targets, you see that um, we focus on two dimensions. On the one hand, on, the, on our sites, and on the other hand, on our products. And um, so we have identified five key levers um, to address and reduce the main sources of greenhouse gas emission, of CO2 emission. Um, it starts um, in the energy production with uh, gray to green and power to steam, um, focusing on avoiding CO2 emissions um, from power and steam generation. And uh, then um, on the uh, chemical production um, in the, in the chemical production, um, it uh, tackles emissions from our upstream and to a lesser extent also from our downstream processes um, by applying uh, new technologies and also um, bio-based renewables. And at the fifth lever, um, it's continuing what we have done successfully in the past at what we called con continuous operational excellence programs to um, tackle energy efficiency. However, our customers are not so much interested in our processes at the site level. Our customers want product with net zero or with low carbon footprint. And that's why we have also um, in parallel uh, started um, the initiative um, to um, really make transparent what is the CO2 emission by product associated with the raw materials, uh, including the associate, uh, associated uh, emissions with uh, the raw materials. And so um, we uh, make this product-related emissions transparent uh, from cradle to grade uh, in form of a product carbon footprint. Um, and uh, we have now made it available for um, our 45,000 products. Yeah, when we now look into the different levers, let's start with the topic of um, electricity uh, and electrical power. And um, coming from uh, uh, the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s of coal, uh, then in the 80s, 90s, un until today, the natural gas as a, as a key raw material, um, there's uh, now the time to embark into um, the renewable energy, and uh, we follow different strategies. Um, on, the, on the one hand, um, we drive uh, the transformation of our power supply by co-investing into um, offshore wind parks. Um, very prominently now, just inaugurated um, a few weeks ago, uh, our joint project with Vattenfall and Allianz uh, in, the, um, in the North Sea. Um, this offshore wind farm uh, will be fully operational um, in the course of the next months. And uh, it comprises almost 140 turbines and uh, with a capacity of 1.5 gigawatts. Um, in addition to this, we also invest into a new solar power plant for our 
German uh, site Schwarzheide near Dresden. Um, and uh, we do this in a joint venture with uh, uh, NVM, um, the local um, utility supplier. And um, this will uh, result um, in a, in a solar park with a 24 megawatt peak capacity um, and um, will comprise um, 40, uh, 52,000 uh, PV modules. Um, in addition to these um, joint ventures, we also concluded um, a couple of long-term supply agreements for uh, renewable energy in the US um, and also our new Verbund site in China um, will be um, supplied by um, renewable energy together with partners um, in China. Yeah, on the one hand, renewable energy supply is key, but um, the most um, or, or the, the, the major share of our um, energy consumption is related to heat. Yeah, we discussed it also yesterday. It's not only electricity, but it's also the, the heat management. And uh, CO2-free um, steam production is, is crucial. And... Um, Today, um, steam generation processes uh, in the central power plants um, have a major contribution to our CO2 emissions. So by electrifying the steam generation with renewable electricity, CO2 emissions at the chemical sites can be significantly reduced. So in order to implement this, it's um, not only um, uh, the um, measure to move to heat pumps, but it's also to include e-boilers and e-drives um, into the system. So overall, also a transformation um, that we need in this area. Yeah, when we now uh, go um, more into um, the, um, the production side, um, so um, there are... Um, around um, 10 basic chemicals that um, relate to 70% of our CO2 emission. Um, and uh, hydrogen and, and the respective nitrogen, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, respective um, ammonia synthesis together with steam reforming is a key contributor to this. Um, and uh, if you uh, then think about the topic that we discussed already um, yesterday and, and so on, now, uh, hydrogen will be a, a key um, lever, and so I would like to share the two projects that we um, run um, on the Ludwigshafen side uh, in order to tap into the future of how the um, hydrogen economy will look like uh, for, for us. Um, on the one hand, oh, sorry, um, <laughs> just going back to the electricity. Um, so electrifying processes, uh, just shifting gear back, um, is also crucial uh, to avoid um, the emissions in our um, steam cracker. So um, today um, the heating of uh, the steam cracker is done by burning uh, natural gas. And uh, we have now uh, started a project uh, to look into um, the heating um, via electricity. And together with Sabic and Linde, we have started the construction of the world's first uh, demonstration plant for large-scale electric electrically heated um, steam cracker furnaces um, at uh, the Ludwigshafen site. Yeah, and with that, now coming to the um, hydrogen topic. So on the one hand, we have a pilot project uh, to run a uh, water electrolyzer in Ludwigshafen, um, resulting in, uh, at full capacity, 8,000 tons of hydrogen, uh, taking the 250,000 tons that we need for Ludwigshafen, it's, it's a pilot project. And on the other side, Professor Schlögel mentioned, uh, we are also embark, uh, we have been embarking um, into the topic of methane paralysis. Um, the, um, the first test plant um, has been also uh, started up um, last year, and uh, we're in the middle of, of the process development here. Um, you can imagine with um, the uh, stoichiometric uh, reaction um, generating three kg um, carbon for one kg hydrogen, um, if there are any um, great ideas to um, utilize the carbon um, for, for uh, value adding um, um, uh, applications, this will also make a 
big difference um, on the economy of these uh, processes. Yeah, and then um, when we come, and uh, please allow me this um, a bit of detour, when we come to the utilization of our products, it is really about um, how we live um, the, the kind of uh, um, pyramid of, of uh, um, the, 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 the recycling uh, approach. So reduce, reuse, recycle is a key for um, implementing circular solutions. And we have um, three areas um, that, that we are focusing on. On the one hand, um, it is circular feedstocks. Um, on the other hand, it's new material cycles and new business models because economy always kicks in. And um, um, here is also, uh, Professor Schlögel, you also mentioned this, it's not, it's not an, an one um, solution fits all um, that will bring us into the new, um, into the future, but it will be really a, a, a massive transformation of the chemical industry that is needed. If you look into um, the various uh, technologies that you need, uh, that, that will be needed um, for really making this um, transformation um, possible in the future. And um, being an analytical chemist by training, I also uh, would like to make a, a plea here, not only to look into the um, synthesis into the process engineering part, but also into the enabling technologies. Professor Schlögel, you said, what knowledge do we need uh, for the future? And I think we have already seen a couple of uh, uh, images um, from uh, uh, electron microscopy and the like. So in order to understand structure, property relations, in order to, un to really zoom into the uh, materials uh, that we need into the processes, um, we I think need also um, to accelerate um, the development of um, the analytical uh, methods and the material physics um, that we need in order to accompany this. Yeah, with that, um, I would like to come to an end if the technic allows. Um, no. <laughs> no, finally, yeah. So finally, let me return to my opening statement. I think enormous challenges are ahead of us, and this means that we must now boldly tackle the transformation, not only of the, um, of the sign of, of the uh, chemical industry, but also um, of uh, the, the environmental and societal impact. And uh, we are taking this path as a company um, straightforward and in a systematic approach, but I'm a strong believer that research and development is at the core of uh, what is needed and um, so I'm very optimistic um, with um, the the team that we have but also with the collaborations that we have that we can make it but uh, we need this we need in the next step the close collaboration with science and uh, politics so let's act now thank you <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so our second speaker is uh, Marcus Oles. Yeah, okay. From Thyssen Group. Yeah, okay. Hello, Marcus. Um, <clears throat> okay, Mar Marcus will show us some of his uh, recent uh, advance in uh, renewable energy, green hydrogen, circular economy. Please, Marcus. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak in front of so much expert scientist as an industrial guy. I think that is not self-evident uh, to do that, uh, but on the other side, I personally believe uh, that we only get progress, that we only can achieve our CO2 reduction targets when we really work hand-in-hand -hand scientists and uh, guys or industry uh, really to achieve uh, progress, otherwise uh, we, we stay or where we are and uh, we, we can't protect uh, our climate uh, and our planet, of course. Um, you maybe have seen or you have seen uh, that slide uh, in the presentation uh, of Mr. Schlögel. Um, there's a reason, of course, for that. We work really close together in a project uh, called Carbon to Chem. 
And what you see there is uh, our pilot plant uh, in the middle of our steel plant in Duisburg, where we use uh, top gases uh, out of our steel production and use that top gases uh, and hand it over to the chemical industry as a new feedstock uh, for chemical synthesis, of course. And there are a couple of uh, challenges uh, we have to overcome for that. Uh, and I try to address some of the challenges uh, we have and, uh, which, and how we solve that together uh, with uh, colleagues uh, from academia. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I like to address a little bit the discussion about defossilization and decarbonization. So I personally believe uh, more on decarbonization than on defossilization. Um, and there are a couple of reasons uh, for that. Uh, the main reason is maybe I have also a background in biology. Um, and uh, I personally know that uh, life, oh, that's too fast that life is not possible without carbon. Yeah? And I try to bring that a little bit in an order where carbon is absolutely necessary and uh, where we have a chance really to substitute carbon via uh, renewable energy or whatever. And what you see on the left-hand side, of course, that is human or plants, biomass, uh, there is an absolute need for carbon and in total uh, the carbon content over the whole planet uh, in that three categories is about 30 to 50 percent of the dry mass. When we're going to cement and limestone, which also is part of our project Carbon to Chem, that's really hard to abate. Uh, there is carbon in the process and unfortunately uh, there is also CO2 as an output of the process. For mobility, is maybe a little bit different, uh, that we really have a chance to substitute some parts of mobility uh, without e-fuels. For chemical and steel industry, it's a little bit different. Uh, of course, a core of the activities uh, in the chemical industry is to please uh, to modify a little bit carbon, let's say it that way. Um, for the steel industry is, of course, uh, an ingredient uh, to reduce ore, uh, but there are alternatives. I come to that uh, later. About process heat, uh, we have heard. E-mobility, of course, we can totally defossilize. Uh, and renewable, of course, too. So I, I like to start with, with two um, um, yeah, statements. Uh, first, decarbonization and defossilization needs more renewable energy. We have heard that. Um, we have an increase in the moment uh, with renewable energy, but this is absolutely needed, and I come to that later, because uh, at least in the steel industry, we have really a huge demand of more energy, more green energy. And the second statement uh, is um, decarbonization and defossilization needs more cross-industrial, and uh, I have to add that uh, uh, also uh, cooperation with academia. Otherwise, we will not solve uh, all the problems we have. Yeah, maybe start uh, with, with um, steel production, and uh, I will not give you now a lecture in metallurgy, um, but um, Today, uh, in Duisburg, we have a production capacity of approximately 11 million tons uh, of steel, what, which is nearly 25% of the steel production in Germany. Uh, and that uh, production is based on carbon, totally based on carbon. And that's, uh, to be honest, part of the problem. If we use carbon uh, as a reducing agent, uh, we have, of course, steel but also a lot of CO2. I mentioned that 20 million tons of CO2 for 11 million tons uh, of steel. That means uh, steel producers are more gas producers than steel producers, at least in, in amount. So when you, what, what is the alternative? Um, the alternative is hydrogen, yeah? That needs a little bit different technologies uh, that we easily, it's not so easy as it sounds, uh, substitute uh, carbon by hydrogen and uh, the byproduct uh, of the steel will be uh, the uh, moisture or water. 
Uh, but what is important to understand here, when you look on the slide uh, in the middle, so when we have a metallurgy based on carbon, uh, we have approximately 50 megajoule uh, energy demand for one kilogram uh, of hot melt. Uh, so that is based 100% on fossils. So when we go on the right-hand side, um, so we have a little bit less energy demand. Uh, it's only 30 in megajoule for one kilogram. Uh, but that is 100% renewable. Otherwise, uh, it is not feasible really to reduce the CO2 emissions. And to give you some figures, um, for one uh, ton of steel, we need approximately 60 kilograms of hydrogen. That's less than the coal. Of coal, you need approximately 250 kilograms. Um, but when you sum that up and say, okay, if we, let's say, transform a site like Duisburg, uh, we have a demand uh, of approximately 70 terawatt hours, which means that are 700,000 uh, uh, tons of hydrogen just for one site. Uh, when you sum that up for Germany, you have 3 million tons uh, of hydrogen uh, demand. And when you now say, okay, uh, we would like to produce that on site, yeah, then you need for, and I have calculated that, uh, an electrolyzer with a capacity uh, of approximately 16 gigawatt. So that's really much more than the German um, um, government uh, is committed. Uh, the Germany is committed to 10 gigawatt, and uh, just the steel industry needs uh, 16 gigawatts. And in terms of energy, that means uh, 150 terawatt hours just going in the production of hydrogen. So that more than half of our renewable energy installed in the moment in the system. So that shows you it is nearly impossible uh, that the uh, end Plus, plus that, yeah, we need additional energy for the process, yeah, for the melters and so on. So that means uh, the steel industry will take the majority uh, of the renewable energy, and if if we not import hydrogen, yeah, and this is of course uh, on the table for the steel industry to import hydrogen. Uh, but what is needed, uh, of course, is um, we need additional pipeline and infrastructure for that. I'd like to address a second uh, point of in, in this transformation, uh, and I'd like to underline this is not a greenfield operation. So this is an operation uh, in where, where we substitute our blast furnaces, and we have uh, four blast furnaces uh, in uh, Duisburg, step by step, um, but that means uh, we start with a final investment decision two months ago, and we hopefully have our first direct reduction unit uh, installed end of 26, and then step by step we substitute um, each blast furnaces with a new direct reduction. We do that because we have the strong commitment to be climate neutral uh, until 2045. Uh, but to be very honest, uh, if we switch to 100% uh, hydrogen, uh, there is a remaining part uh, of CO2. And the remaining part is not, let's say, just a few kilograms, uh, but in the range of 2 to 4 million tons of CO2. And that's the reason uh, why we said, okay, we, we need a strategy where we also be able to handle that remaining part of CO2. And uh, the approach to do that is the come to come approach. I come to that later. Um, I like to summarize the, that part uh, a little bit uh, with some figures uh, which I have found in different studies. Um, 
just to, to give you an overview how much more additional energy we need uh, just for the decarbonization. And that is really a huge number. That's for the chemical industry, steel, refinery, mobility, and so on. And in Europe, it will be uh, in the range of 4,000 or more than 4,000 terawatt hours. So that is really a huge uh, amount uh, which, which we have to bring in the system. Maybe to the second part, uh, working in cross-industrial networks. I mentioned uh, that we, we start uh, with the Carbon to Camp project um, uh, with the idea to hand over CO2 emissions, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen from one industry to the other industries. And I mentioned that we have a, a lot of uh, so-called top gas or process gas in, in steel making. By the way, that's the same for waste incineration, limestone industry, and so on. Uh, but uh, in Duisburg, we are focused uh, on, on steel production. And uh, with the conventional um, route, uh, which is based uh, on, on uh, blast furnaces, um, we use a couple of that uh, gases, uh, top gases, uh, to produce heat, of course. Yeah? We burn that. And we have to substitute that, uh, by the way, uh, also when we switch to, let's say, 100% uh, hydrogen-based metallurgy. So that sometimes uh, is forgotten uh, that we also have to do a lot or a hell of work uh, in the downstream uh, process. Uh, uh, Mrs. Seidel mentioned that uh, with electrification, uh, but also in the steel industry, in the glass industry, and so on, uh, there is really a huge uh, challenge uh, to switch uh, to uh, all that heating process, industrial heating process, to fossil-free energy. And of course, uh, we need uh, electrolyzer, yeah? and uh, I mentioned that uh, the, the scale uh, we need, uh, but in the future, and that is a little bit the challenge, yeah? we have a system which is changing, changing from, let's say, 100% uh, fossil-based to, in the future, 100% hydrogen-based. Yeah? And uh, if we say we like to hand over, uh, a top gas, uh, which is uh, in the beginning based on 100% fossil based, yeah, and try to convince the chemical industry to say, um, yeah, we are on a journey, uh, by the way, which uh, takes uh, 20 years, uh, but trust us, yeah, uh, but make your final investment decision now. Uh, that's really a challenge uh, because uh, a, a lot can happen during that way, of course, yeah. Um, but uh, there we have uh, to work hand in hand, and beside the, let's say, uh, investment decisions, uh, there are also a couple of really challenging questions, yeah, in how does the top gas change, and I give you an example where industry and academia work really hand in hand uh, together with the Max Planck Institute, which has really a highly sophisticated analysis, uh, or had met uh, a highly sophisticated analysis of our top gases. Uh, they found more than 2,000 substances uh, and components uh, in our top gases we didn't know before, yeah? On the PPM level, yes, uh, but nevertheless, if you hand that over to the chemical industry, uh, the chemical industry is highly interested uh, also on that PPM level, otherwise they destroy uh, really uh, their catalyst. And I guess this is a nice example which shows it, it's not all done. Yeah? Uh, there's a, a lot of work to do also during that process, uh, which we, by the way, do in the Calm to Camp project. So maybe um, a last, uh, or a, uh, not really the last slide, uh, how, uh, who is part of, of the, the Calm to Chem project? And when you look on the left-hand side, uh, it is absolutely necessary that we had a lot of partners uh, from yeah, chemical industry, uh, chemical engineering, um, electrolyzer, uh, but, uh, and also recycling industry, but also on the right-hand side, uh, really, and we are very proud of that, uh, a lot of highly ranked uh, scientific partners with Max Planck Society, Fraunhofer Society, RWTH Aachen, Ruhr University, and so on, and we really work close together to solve that problem, which is really, beside um, solving the problem, really 
a good interaction between scientists and guys from the industry. And what you see on the left-hand side, uh, our idea is, of course, to close the carbon cycle. And uh, Professor Schlögel mentioned it. Um, we, if we really close that, uh, or really want to close the cycle 100%, uh, we have also deliver solutions for uh, CO2 emissions, uh, which are not point emissions. Yeah? That means uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere we have to extract. And for that reason, of course, uh, direct air capture is essential uh, to at least uh, bring uh, or share um, part of, uh, of the reduction uh, to CO2, not in, in the next 10 years. Uh, I personally believe that not, because just the energy uh, is not there, and there will be a fight uh, around uh, the renewable energy um, which is very important. So last, not least, um, um, is there a market for that? Yeah? And uh, I'm working for an industry, um, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, the customer have to pay for the products, yeah? and if, if there is not a customer there to take over the product, yeah, so the industry will die, and uh, the whole society will more or less die. So the challenge is really that we, we are in, on a journey, and a journey where we have uh, less CO2 emissions, uh, which is good, no question about that, uh, but uh, we have to trust uh, uh, potential investors uh, to switch to a new raw material uh, of CO2. In the middle, it's a little bit small, uh, you see uh, the technology it's not 100% available, uh, but uh, it is available in terms of use CO2 to produce uh, chemicals, yeah, that's, that's given. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, there's also a demand. The carbon uh, demand in the chemical industry is really huge, and uh, they can't substitute uh, that by nitrogen, for example, yeah? because then they have a complete, or hydrogen, then they have a complete different uh, product. Uh, so that's are really hard to abate in, in their products. Um, and we personally believe there is a market also for CCU technologies. Uh, oh, oh, wrong way. So last slide, I'd like to thank you uh, once again. And uh, we, you, what, what you can do is you can also read uh, all our results in publications uh, like Chemie Ingenieur. And it's really, it's good to see that, that in, in that publications, scientists and guys from the industry really publish papers together. And this is, I guess, personally um, believe that um, it is absolutely necessary uh, that uh, from an industrial point we are more open uh, also to academia and bring our problems also on the table, but also the other way around um, to say, okay, um, it, it is of course to make money, yeah, uh, but it's also to implement uh, new sol uh, solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me and, and for hosting this meeting. I'm super excited to be here and to learn about all the work that all of you have been sharing. Uh, so with that, uh, my name is Patricia Hidalgo Gonzalez and I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego. So today I'm going to be talking about some of our long duration storage modeling, specifically for the Western North American grid. But before getting into that, I'll briefly talk about what are some of the research directions that we have in my laboratory that relate to the decarbonization question that we've been discussing. And then I'll go into the details of this most recent work that we've been doing for the California Energy Commission. Thank you. Is that better? You can hear me okay? Oh, all right. All right, so my lab is called the Renewable Energy and Advanced Mathematics Lab. And we have the mission to develop mathematical tools for the integration of renewable energy. But what we keep at heart is that we want solutions that can be implemented. So being mindful of the legacy systems that we have and the concerns of the different partners that we have in our grid. And in terms of the research thrust that we have, we do work on long-term planning in power systems for the United States and other regions as well. We also look at real-time operations and control schemes for low inertia systems as you'll hear from some of our colleagues in, in a few hours. 
and have also been working in the development of data-driven techniques that are safe from a perspective of control theory, in particular for power systems, for which I'm part of an IEEE task force. And in addition to this, um, more of our recent projects are looking at what could be the electricity market redesign or tariff redesign so we can have a more resilient and reliable grid with an emphasis on vulnerable communities in California. So this project's particularly focusing on em at environmental justice and energy justice. And last but not least, we also work on management of distributed energy resources from the perspective of developing methods to control these assets, and also from the perspective of deployment in the microgrid that we have at UC San Diego that was recently awarded $40 million from the National Science Foundation. So it's a great playground to have, so if any of you are interested in testing your algorithms, you're all welcome to join us. And from a methodological perspective, um, we draw from techniques in optimization, control theory, and machine learning. And I'm very grateful for the institutions that have been funding our work, of course. And today I'll be focusing on one of the projects where we look at long-term planning in the US with the focus on long-duration storage. So this work, uh, it's led by my student Martin Stadiker, and we're looking at the value of long-duration storage as a function of different conditions that the grid might experience in a zero emissions future. So the motivation for this work is that we still don't know in the United States how much duration and energy capacity, therefore power capacity, we will need for storage to support this growing demand and a zero emissions uh, grid in the future. And some studies have been reporting that this is possible to achieve with 100% renewable energy with and without storage. Some of them say uh, others rely on clean, firm power, and others even take it farther, and they say that biomass could enable an, a negative emissions future. And another set of studies have been focusing at intraday storage as well as some seasonal storage in a few cases most recently. So with that, uh, the contributions of this work that I'm going to be discussing today focus on a couple of different, different aspects that determine what will be that optimal deployment of long duration storage as well as the optimal operation. So first, we look at what would be the benefits in terms of electricity pricing if we were to have a set of either federal or state mandates that would require a certain energy capacity of long duration storage um, in, in the WEC, as you'll see in a couple of slides. And we also look at what would be the optimal deployment of LDS or long duration storage as a function or depending on a few different factors that we can experience in the grid. So the first one, we look at what happens if we have regions that are more solar dominant or more wind dominant, what would be the optimal duration and characteristics of that storage to support those regions. We also look at uh, a very politically relevant question in the United States, it's that what would happen if transmission ex expansion were to be restricted because of all the regulatory processes that go in that um, aspect. So we want to understand if we're not able to expand transmission the way that an optimal model will tell us, what would we require in terms of storage deployment? And we also look at a sensitivity on the cost target for different long duration storage. And the idea here is not to prescribe or try to predict what those cost targets would be, but more as they use it as a lookup table where different companies can say, if we get to this certain cost target, what would be the optimal deployment in the work so they can understand what would be their market penetration if they were to get to that cost target. And last but not least, we also look at what happens as a function of the hydropower availability. So from the perspective of climate change, if we see our hydro resource being impacted, this is one of the key flexibility sources in the United States. So it would definitely uh, require more um, long duration storage in this case. Uh, because of time, I'll focus only on three of these factors. So we'll be looking at the impacts of having LDS mandates, the impacts of having either more solar or wind dominant regions in the Western North America grid, and the impact of these different cost targets for long duration storage. And in terms of the methodology that we use, we use a capacity expansion model that I'll briefly describe in the next few slides, where we are sampling six hours per day and we are modeling all 365 days in 2050. So we can actually capture the operation of a long duration storage asset. And we are forcing a zero emissions future for the WEC in 2050 as well. 
So for this work, we have been using the SwitchWeg model, which is an open source model. You're welcome to download or get a clone from our GitHub repo. We have a few examples, so you can start playing with that model. You can also customize it for your regions. And we are always looking for more contributors, so definitely go ahead and play with the model if, if you're interested. So in, in this broader description, it's a capacity expansion model. For this particular study, we're running it as a deterministic program that's linear. However, the model has the capability to be run as a stochastic program, for example, to take into account the uncertainty from climate change, as we've done in the past. And also, we, also, we have the capability to run it with unit commitment. Well, hence, it wouldn't be a linear program anymore, but it would be a mixed integer program instead. But for this particular set of research questions, we focus on the deterministic version and linear version. And as a capacity expansion model, it minimizes the total cost of operating the power system in terms of transmission and generation, its investments, and also operation. Geographically, we cover the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, so the area in orange in that map, mm -hmm. and we split it in 50 load zones, meaning that we have 50 independent projections for hourly loads uh, over 50 smaller regions in the WEC. And in terms of time, this model, it's really flexible. So depending on the user, you can customize what will be your investment periods. So you could have, for example, investment periods every one year or every 10 years. And in the case of these studies, we only look at one investment period in 2050. Similarly, the time resolution, it's also very flexible and up to the user. And in this particular study, we model, as I said before, three, all 365 days. And sampling every four hours so we can capture the operation of long duration storage. But that being said, uh, depending on the research question, you can also sample a subset of days uh, to be able to reduce the computational complexity of the resulting model. And here's to give you a sense of the inputs and therefore outputs that we can get from this model. We use all existing 3,000 generators in the WEC. We use roughly a little bit over 7,000 potential new generators for solar and wind power. So in those figures, what you're looking at are the already filtered and clustered potential locations for wind candidates in the WEC and also for solar candidates in the bottom figure. So this comes from a highly uh, resolution data set from NREL, the wind toolkit, for example, where they had two kilometers square resolution for the wind data. And then on that, we added, we added layers of removing uh, land where you couldn't deploy any of these projects and also then we selected the top 10 performing, 10% uh, performing in terms of capacity factor, and also being mindful of what would be the cost of connection to the closest substation. So that's how we downscale from all the data that NREL has into what will be most likely to be deployed um, generators in the future. And for in the case of transmission, we aggregate the lines, so this can be tractable, and we have hourly loads for all these 50 zones that we have, as well as hourly capacity factors for wind and solar power. And of course, we use as inputs uh, cost projections for these technologies. And for outputs, the classical outputs from a capacity expansion model, where we look at what will be the optimal investment by decade or for 2050 in our case study. Also, we obtain what will be the hourly dispatch if we're modeling with an hourly resolution. And also we get what will be the transmission expansion and operation of new and existing lines, as well as emissions by generator and total cost um, of that resulting scenario. So now let's get into some of these results of this study. So in this first set of results, um, okay, you can see that. Uh, I'll be focusing on the question on what happens if we have a more solar or wind dominant grid. So in these two figures, you're looking at results from two separate scenarios. The one on the left over here, we're forcing exogenously to have a more solar dominant WEC where we have 90% solar power versus roughly 10% wind power. And the figure on the right is looking at a more wind dominant grid where we have 40% solar and 60% wind. And in the pie charts, what you're looking at, it's the capacity build out by technology uh, labeled by the different colors. So for example, in the southwest, we see a lot of yellow that's representing solar power and a little bit of light green, which is representing storage. And another key aspect of this figure that I want to highlight is the dots that are in the center of the pie charts. Those are colored in shades of pink, and that's representing the duration of storage that gets optimally deployed 
for all these 50 regions that we have in the WEC. So in terms of the results, as you can see, if we look at the, the solar dominant uh, regions, for example, here in the southwest in both scenarios, we see that we have a light pink dot that's representing six to 10 hours of duration get optimally deployed to support solar power. And then in the case of the zones, for example, that we see more in the Rockies over here, if I move. There. So in the darker blue, that's the wind deployment. We see that we have a darker pink representing 10 to 20 hours of storage duration. And now we shift gears uh, a little bit and we look at the other set of scenarios where we were testing different cost targets to understand what will be the optimal deployment of long duration storage across the WEC. So in this case, the different uh, rows that we have in the table are representing individual scenarios that we were testing, where what we change across these scenarios is the energy storage cost that we assume. And here with this range, we're not trying to prescribe what it's going to happen in, ter in terms of cost assumption, but we want to better understand what if scenarios. So meaning if a certain technology for long duration were to achieve any of these cost targets, what will be the optimal, for example, uh, total terawatt hours deployed in the WEC, or what will be, for example, the largest storage duration that we would see in the WEC and, and other relevant metrics. So what I want to uh, draw your attention to, it's a couple of these results rather than going through the full table, of course. So with this range that goes from roughly $100 per kilowatt hour all the way to $0.5 per kilowatt hour, we see that the energy capacity ranges uh, substantially. So it goes from 1.5 terawatt hours optimally deployed all the way to 36 terawatt hours optimally deployed in the cheapest cost target that we're testing. Now, if we look at what that means in terms of the largest duration that we would observe work-wide, we see that that number also ranges substantially going from roughly nine hours all the way to over 800 hours duration. And last but not least, uh, given that storage can complement transmission as a flexibility asset, we also observe that if some technology were to get to the lowest um, cost assumption, the one the $0.5 per kilowatt hour at the bottom, we would see um, a reduction in 75% of transmission needing to be deployed work-wide, which is a huge um, decrease, so we definitely want to be mindful of that as we might continue encountering political hurdles to expanding transmission. So now uh, shifting gears again a little bit. Let's see if I can, oops. Okay, this moved forward a little faster, but let me walk you through this figure first. So on the figure on the left, we're looking at the y-axis. Those are electricity prices, and that we get from the dual value of the constraint in our model where we force it to meet the load at every hour that we're modeling. And then on the x-axis, we're looking at different storage energy capacity mandates. So basically, each of the points that we see across the x-axis is representing the results that we get from one scenario that we run. So in the case of zero, we're not forcing any mandate and we're obtaining the distribution for LMPs uh, in that scenario where we wouldn't have any storage mandate. And as we move through the x-axis, we're looking at different mandates that we were testing uh, for different scenarios. So for example, we tested what would happen if we forced to have two terawatt hours of energy capacity installed in the WEC, and then what would happen, for example, when we have 20 terawatt hours all the way to 64 terawatt hours being forced in, in the WEC. So the first result here that I want to highlight that it's going to be guiding us in this analysis is that across all the mandates that we were testing, the one where we force the 20 terawatt hour of duration being installed, that one results in the one that um, drastically reduces the variability of LMPs that we observe, more so relatively than any other increasing mandate for energy capacity. So we will focus our attention on that 20 terawatt hours that we observe has a big impact. Now on the second figure on the right, we're still looking at prices of electricity on the y-axis and the same scenarios of storage mandates that we were exploring. But now we are breaking this, this down by different regions. So if you recall, we had 50 regions in our model and here we're clustering so it's easier to visualize what's happening. So as expected, 
um, different regions are going to experience different LMPs as we experience nowadays. But even more, if this tendency will continue in a 2050 future where we have zero emissions. And now in this third panel, we're still looking on the y-axis to LMPs and then the different storage mandates that we tested on the x-axis. But now we're clustering by hour that we simulated. So the result that we see over here is that the hours that have the lowest LMPs are going to be between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., so these three curves over here. And that's because that's when we have the highest generation from solar power, so that brings our LMPs substantially down. And again, uh, no matter how we're cutting and slicing this data, we always see that the 20 terawatt hours, it's the storage mandate that would have the most substantial relative impact from the ones that we tested. And last but not least, I also want to show you what happens if we do this clustering, but now by month. So here we still see LMPs, the different storage scenarios that we tested on the x-axis. And the two curves uh, at the top are representing the LMPs that we obtained in December and then in July. And those are the highest ones. And that makes sense because that's when we experience the highest cost, I mean, the highest demand uh, work-wide. And similarly, we see that when we get to the scenario where we force 20 terawatt hours of storage mandate or more, that volatility gets substantially decreased and then the prices start converging as we have a higher uh, energy capacity mandate. So with that, I would like to conclude that as we saw, depending on the grid composition, if it's either solar dominant region or an either wind dominant region, we will obtain different optimal durations to support that type of generation. So in the case of solar power, we see six to 10 hour duration optimally supporting solar. And in the case of wind dominant regions in the work, we saw 10 to 20 hours of duration optimally supporting uh, that region. We also observe that R&D can play a key role in determining that optimal deployment of LDS or long duration storage. And to give an example here, if the energy capacity capital cost would get to $5 per kilowatt hours, that would enable, for example, optimally deployed 20 hour, 28 hours of mean duration work-wide, observing a maximum of 400 hours work-wide as well. And last but not least, this is part of what I think it's super important to consider as we move forward, regulation can have a huge impact as we've been discussing. So in this case, I wanted to portray what would be the importance and uh, the value of having storage mandates in the face of mitigating the volatility of prices of electricity in a zero emissions grid. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions and probably open it to the other speakers as well. Thank you again. There is one from Jay. Hey, so let's start. So, um, Patricia, thank you. That was an absolutely delightful talk. Uh, so I just want to confirm what I saw, that even at a half a dollar per kilowatt hour, seasonal storage is not feasible. All you get is a month, right? So we get different results. I'll, I'll be happy to discuss, but we do see seasonal storage with that type of cost target. So maybe dependent on the power capacity cost that was assumed. So maybe we're a little more optimistic on that end. Uh, but yeah, I'll be happy to show more figures because we start seeing seasonal storage at, at that low cost target. Okay, and you know, because your curves show that you've naturally depressed prices, how do you pay for even the one month storage that you have? Absolutely. So that's part of what we discussed in this paper that I hope the preprint comes out in the next few weeks. I'll be happy to share. But that's an open challenge in my perspective. How would the market then remunerate that type of arbitrage that we don't have like that market scheme nowadays in the United States? So we need to think, do we need to create new ancillary services to then provide the right signals for that behavior to take place? Because in the current market, there's no incentive to do any, anything like that. Or should it come from uh, subsidies, for instance, as we were discussing earlier? So that's certainly an open question. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So we have another 10 minutes of questions and answers in total, and many questions already. So I think Deepak is next, Eva Schill, and then the others. Yes. I, um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to give one right now for Marcus, I think. Um, 
loved your presentation. Glad to see all the progress you're making. Um, we've been following uh, molten oxide electrolysis, uh, which can directly use, uh, uh, you know, kind of renewable energy to do electrolysis of uh, molten iron oxide at 1600 degrees C. Um, any comment on that? Is that something you guys are looking at? Because it seems to be less complex and more modular and more distributed than a large Bessemer kind of plant. So to be honest, we are not working on that area because the history uh, of Thyssen Group is a little bit different. Uh, the history is coming from chloralkaline electrolyzer, and that's the reason why we are now shifted to uh, alkali electrolyzer. Okay, next one, if I should. Yeah, I have a question to you, Patricia. So you considered wind and solar. So why didn't you consider geothermal? You have the largest production in the world in California, and you have the largest potential in the world across the basin and range. So it would perfectly fit to your area. Yes, so we do consider geothermal and biomass um, and other technologies that I didn't mention. But in terms of the cost projections from NRO, that's what we were using, the moderate projections. We see a lot more solar and wind power deployed, but we are considering geothermal, uh, absolutely, yes. But maybe we need to be a little more progressive in the cost projections that we have. If I may add this, I think you, it, it would be nice to come up with a new uh, model including geothermal and basically showing what is the need from geothermal because then you could replace also the topic of storage quite a lot, so. I 100% agree. We could do the same type of analysis, but with a cost sensitivity on geothermal. What would it take to see it deployed? Yeah, thank you. So next one, Granger Morgan and uh, Ben Drech afterwards. So, Carla, that was a great talk. Um, you have an enormous amount of, of uh, capital intensive hardware, and you're talking about increasing the amount of uh, uh, variable and intermittent energy input can you talk to us a little about issues of capacity factors? Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's right. And I think uh, the, the, the challenge is that uh, if you look into our, um, into our um, current um, energy um, consumption, um, we, it, it is uh, almost um, worldwide. Uh, um, 53 uh, terawatt hours a year and uh, out of this um, 40 terawatt hours of steam uh, so so uh, steam is really the guiding uh, the guiding uh, uh, principle so I can save steam and that's how I can smooth yeah and uh, and I think it uh, it 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 will um, require also the continuous uh, supply of renewable energy. So, um, I mean, we, at least that, I would say, is the current assumption that uh, that uh, whatever is produced will be transmitted to the sites already in a way that, that there is a kind of uh, continuous supply. Um, so, so it's then part of the utility. Also, it's it's a question who takes care. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course, if you think about our investment uh, in the joint uh, project at the North Sea, um, between the North Sea and Ludwigshafen, there are I don't know a few hundred kilometers um, to. Um, or a couple of hundred kilometers, um, that, that we also need the grid uh, kind of connection that can handle these amounts. And I think it's also true for Trusen Group. And then on site, we also need to then um, upgrade our, our electrical grid in order to cope with um, the um, additional electricity um, that we have to handle. And we assume that by 2040, the electricity demand increases by three to four times. So that gives you a, a feeling on what does it also mean for the grid uh, on site as well as um, the transmission lines and, and uh, transformers and the like to the, to the sites. Thank you. Um, Dirk Uwe Yi Chui, Kira Refeld, and Valerie. And Joel Sasson also. So, 
Yeah, thank you very much. I just would like to add a, sh a short uh, comment from the German perspective on the long-term storage, which you both discussed, um, because there just have been published numbers uh, on cost for digging the uh, caverns from salt domes, and they were exactly at 50 euro cent per kilowatt hour of storage capacity in pure hydrogen. Uh, so this uh, fits uh, well into this. And then the other thing is a big discussion how to finance um, the gas uh, power plants which are needed to, to re-electrify the gas. Yeah? And uh, there are two different schools. So one says we leave it to the market. Yeah? There will be very high cost for electricity sometimes, and this will pay for everything. And uh, But many people have lost confidence uh, that uh, politics really will let run these high costs after what we have seen in the last year due to the uh, Russian war in the Ukraine. The prices went high and politics at the first moment said, okay, now the market is not very good anymore, so we have to counterbalance this. Um, and therefore, um, uh, even uh, several uh, or, um, uh, commissions, uh, which are cons to consultancy to the government, has said we need something like capacity markets. Yeah? So we have to pay. Um, the uh, operators of the gas t uh, turbines for being there. And this is, yeah, then it's becoming more or less um, part as of the infrastructure as a grid. Yeah? The grid is also paid for being there and uh, not for the transmission they are doing. Uh, and this uh, would be uh, quite uh, similar. Uh, but uh, that's uh, indeed a key fact. And uh, the uh, German uh, power plant operators wait for the final decision how these markets will be, because uh, we need a lot of them until 2030, because uh, then, until then we have a shutdown of several of our coal power plants, and we need replacement. And uh, to be in time with the power plants, we need now political decisions, and they are pending. Yi, yeah, please. Got a couple questions. The first one for uh, Marcus. So you mentioned hydrogen refining. Uh, how mature is the hydrogen reduction process uh, to make steel right now? Uh, because of hydrogen is so reactive. What uh, I mean, I, I repeat that again. The hydrogen embrittlement problem of that uh, furnace. Right? Is that a done deal? How, how, how mature is that? So uh, as far as I know at Stanford, we have some research going on on that process. It seems to me it's uh, not so mature by lab to learn, yeah. Okay, that's really a hard question. <laughs> um, so we have just received a funding of two billion uh, to invest in that technology uh, from, <laughs> let's say, um, we, at least the steel industry, and not saying ThyssenKrupp, uh, but, but also ThyssenKrupp is highly committed on that. Uh, the whole steel industry in Germany, at least, uh, I can overview, uh, is highly committed to that technology and uh, is, is pretty sure uh, that this is a technology which runs at the end of the day. So we have some smaller demonstration, and I guess that's uh, what, what, you, what you like to make the point, uh, which, which were in operation, and, uh, but we, we believe uh, there, there are evidence that it works. So, and another word is uh, maybe not so mature yet, but uh, with this investment, right, uh, it will be mature. Uh, is that my understanding correct? <laughs> That, okay. That's okay, if I, it's I a really sensitive like affecting question. your business. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are really huge companies yeah, who invested in, in, in that technologies, and this is not only the steel industry, it's also the, the producer uh, of all the equipment, yeah, the SMS, yeah. Uh, Tenova, and so on. They had a lot of experience, and at least, uh, to be a little bit more serious, um, we, we absolutely uh, know that the reduction with natural gas yeah, runs. So there are uh, many, many yeah. installations worldwide uh, where with 70% uh, uh, nitrogen content, yeah, uh, these installations produce a perfect uh, pig mm -hmm. iron. Yeah? Uh, so a at least uh, there's a, a good base uh, uh, where we can start. Yeah, thank you. Second question for Patricia, I also for the grid expert right here. So the long duration energy storage, often time I've seen is um, people say, hey, it's uh, four hours, six hours, eight hours, or 12 hours. O only think about single uh, duration. 
But in reality, if I'm the owner of a long duration energy storage, I have 12 hours capacity, I'm going to use that for hour by hour as well, not just 12 hours. Then there's a mixture of economics com coming in, Patricia, so how do you handle that problem? I mean, through my startup company, when we uh, have the, uh, a customer, we can see the next coming is very flexible time scale of energy storage that makes sense. It's not a single hour. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. I think that's part of the unexplored uh, new landscape that we will have. So from that perspective, when I refer to duration, it's just the ratio between energy capacity to power capacity, but you could operate that however you want. So if you want to do daily cycles, even though you could do seasonal cycles, you could from the perspective of how we're modeling it. However, depending on the technology, you are going to have different efficiencies. So that's going to determine how much you cycle from a cost perspective um, tendency. But if there were to be a technology that it's, doesn't care about if you're cycling hourly or per day or per season, uh, the model can be agnostic like that and let it cycle with that pattern for sure. Yes, so yeah, I agree. It's an open landscape. Okay. Three more questions, and then we have to finish. Kira Riefeld first, please. So, uh, my question would go to Patricia, but to some extent also, no, to Patricia um, predominantly. Um, so you modeled scenarios for 2050, and, I was, and you mentioned that basically this is also influenced by the changing climate and changing energy, energy demand. Um, you mentioned seasonal and diurnal fluctuations. I was wondering about the scenario that you take into account. I mean, by 2050, the different um, scenarios for decarbonization are not completely decoupled, but um, they come with several constraints regarding climate modeling. Absolutely. I 100% agree. And in this work, we didn't incorporate climate impacts. For example, for hydropower, we took, if I recall correctly, the median year from the historical data that we had. However, in results that I didn't show, then we run sensitivities around that, looking at what happens if we're restricted to 50% availability. And even though in the WEC, that's roughly, hydropower has like roughly 10% or 15% of the generation, reducing it to 50%, it had a huge impact on the duration of storage that we would expect. Even though in generation, it's pretty low, the share, but it's a substantial impact. Uh, and we have another paper that I didn't show that it's under review right now where we look at the climate impact. So there we use 10 different climate models that are predicting what would happen with hydropower and loads. And then we run all these scenarios and try to understand what are the shortcomings if we were to model our future only looking at one projection. So we want to understand more holistically that grid operators cannot be or cannot ignore anymore the climate impacts uh, as we move forward. So I'll be happy to share that preprint when it comes out, but it's not there yet. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have Yoel Sasson online. Yoel, do you hear us? Please, your question. I know. And then to... Thank you. Um, we learned from Mary in the morning that methane is a critical component in uh, as greenhouse gas and uh, that there are many uh, escapes of uh, methane from various facilities now at the same time we didn't hear not from marcus and not from clara that their companies are doing anything about it and i wonder why So anybody wants to answer? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this uh, question. I think uh, um, actually it was also discussed during uh, the dinner conversations earlier um, um, at, at, at the trip. Uh, and I think uh, not only in terms of uh, methane, but also in terms of hydrogen. Um, I mean, from an environmental uh, point of view, we have to monitor anyway the emissions uh, of any plant. I don't talk about um, 
the uh, uh, the pipes um, the pipelines but uh, but I will take it I don't have a I don't have a, a comprehensive answer to it I'll, I'll take it back um, and uh, it, it is something that yeah um, a challenge that uh, that was not so obvious to me but uh, it seems that it's uh, it's also uh, great to hear that in the um, academic uh, um, working groups that is um, yeah, under scrutiny, and um, I'll take it back and, and come back to you with that. Thank you. Two more, and then we have to finish. Valerie. Yes, yeah, so my question is actually from Marcos on the, I guess, refining a little bit Yi's question, what should the research priorities be for academics uh, in this area of hydrogen direct reduced to iron? So is it around um, the process itself and uh, the encapsulation of unreduced material that can come sometimes has been found to occur in the peer-reviewed literature, which can, again, um, create problems in the actual furnace, or is it more after the fact in terms of transportability and storability and uh, properties of the hydrogen-reduced material compared to the... Um, natural gas uh, or carbon-based process. If you could, I mean, you give, give, maybe trying to think about some, um, some productive areas, uh, or is it going to be all settled within the next few years with the new projects coming online? Or are there areas of research that academics can usefully take up? I guess there are a couple of, of areas for research. Um, uh, maybe the most important for the steel industry is you have different qualities of ore uh, and how to handle that uh, and also what, what are the right parameters uh, to, to get the, the best product as possible. I guess uh, that's something what is really of high importance and of course uh, also to qualify let's say lower grades of ore uh, for that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one, Beatriz Odanqueña, please. Um, the question is for Dr. Seidel. So it was very nice to see that BASF is now also looking into electrolysis, and um, I was uh, surprised to see, actually I, I'm, I'm aware, but uh, you were speaking about PEM technology, and um, we see in Germany recently that several of the large companies are trying to move away from the PEM technology because of the iridium cost. Is this something that um, you are considering and is, was there a reason to choose PEM for your effort? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think, um, I mean, you, you can imagine with um, the focus on the methane pyrolysis, let me, let me go one step back. Um, we, um, in the first step, also ask ourselves, should we, uh, should we pilot also other technologies? Um, and uh, then finally the decision was uh, yes, because um, it is not so much about the technology itself at the moment, it's more how to integrate it into the site, um, how to um, really also run a project like this um, uh, on site. And, and um, I mean, in, in, in terms of, um, don't talk about the technology, but in terms of deployment, it's also numbering up. So it's really a get, get acquaintance uh, to, the, to the technology. And I think, um, um, it is too early to, to discuss any um, longer term investment into, into larger scale. And I think uh, as with all these uh, new technologies, the question is what will be, will there be a final winner uh, probably in, 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 in the electrolyzers world? Um, there might be, but, but for others, um, for other approaches, um, there will be, um, um, I think, a need for, for different technologies for the different uh, requirements. So um, first is, is really to get into um, working with, electro, uh, with an electrolyzer, installing it, working with it, in, integrating it, it, our um, hydrogen network um, on site, um, and, and having um, this experience as, as a foundation um, for the other um, decisions to be made in the next years. So thank you very much. I give now the word to Leos uh, for the closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, so I think the discussion was, uh, was already complete and long. Um, um, 
I think it's an important area. Uh, in my opinion, uh, to be honest, uh, dec decarbonization and the defilization are quite um, going to the same target or maybe similar. Um, but it seems that uh, from the company's point of view, uh, there is some, uh, um, at least an attention and progress. Um, and, uh, and sure, we have a lot, uh, still a lot uh -huh. to here. Like for, uh, and I think there is still a lot of, of, of things, I, yeah, I think, from, from the academia point of view. Um, yeah, and then by that, I want to close the session. Uh,